Well, again, it's good to be with you today, and I want to thank our, our volunteers and team members that make these services possible. It's great to have our, our worship team, our elders, audiovisual greeters, Sabbath school teachers, everyone that is part of our church family. It always makes every Sabbath special. It's great to hear Carlos singing. We know he can play bass. Get him on a microphone. That's awesome. Appreciate you guys so much. Heavenly Father, uh, I continue in this spirit of worship and, and uh, submission and prayer right now, Father. I pray that the next few moments, uh, your name would be uplifted and your plan would become clear to us, Father. And as we spend time in your word and we contemplate uh, the times in which we live, Father, just bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, throughout the preparation and planning of, of each service, you, you expect to have a certain line of thinking or presentation, but sometimes things come up that shift in what you're going to do and what you're going, going to say, and, and this week is one of those weeks. Last week was a, 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 you know, a presentation on, on just an orientation of life and a consideration of, of what the promises we know God has in store for us. You know, we need to be ready and thinking about our lives, um, and the title was Then What? This week, uh, I stuck with the title, uh, in light of that, Now What? Um, but the material has shifted, as I will share in just a few moments. I do like to begin with having some interaction time with our, our kids, with the kids quiz. So I see Toby jumping up, um, and, uh, and Jaden, our two microphone engineers, are going to help. So, um, if you would like to help, I'd love to get you engaged here. What do you think Jesus' favorite topic was to talk about? Okay, here are some options for you. I saw uh, Dylan put his hand up. He thinks he knows. Jesus' favorite topic. What do you got, Dylan? Does the black mic work in? Oh, anyone over here? <laughs> Is this mic working? Oh, your brother Isaiah. Isaiah, he might beat you to the punch. Sorry. Tess, Tess. Us. Us. Us? That's a great topic. Jesus loved talking about us. That's awesome. We're going to give Dylan a try too. Dylan? Second coming. Oh, he says the second coming. Any, any other guesses? Come on, young people, we'd love to have your, is that it then? Okay, Abel. Abel will give the last one here. Wait, we got one over here. Never mind. Abel, what do you say? E. He says the poor and the needy. All right, you ready? There's a little bit of an argument about it, actually. <laughs> If you've ever been to a spiritual financial seminar, you'll hear him tell you all day long, Jesus' favorite topic was money. Um, that may be true in a technical sense. However, I think it's a little bit of cheating uh, because just because Jesus references money and a lot of what he says, I don't think he's always talking about money. Like in some of his parables, Jesus will say the kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes out to plow a field and he finds a great treasure in that field. He sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, is the purpose of that parable money? It's really about the value of the kingdom of heaven, right? He's not telling you, you know, the, the goods or bads of money or anything. He references money. So, yes, he does talk about possessions and money a lot. But uh, in another way, and if you really add all of his statements together, he talks about the second coming an awful lot. That the longest discourse in all the Bible of Jesus' continual speech is Matthew 23, 24, and 25, which is almost all dedicated to last day things in the coming. So um, I'll let you debate that yourselves on, on which you think is the absolute truth there. Number two, how often does the Bible say fear not or its equivalent, do not fear, or, um, have no fear? What do you say? We've got some options. About 50. Abel, he was like ready. He's like, that's an easy question. Of course everyone knows this. Abel. More than 100. He says more than 100. We've got kind of this dichotomy between where the, the young people are. Dylan? About 50. He says about 50. Any other, any other guesses? 
Ketsy with your mom's elbow help? 365. 365. One for each day of the year. You want to know the truth? Abel had it right from the beginning. <laughs> now, the 365, I'll, I'll tell you, that, that is tricky. I actually, you know, you grow up, you got to be careful what preachers tell you. You do. I grew up being told that the Bible said, fear not 365 times. Any of you ever heard that before? One for each day of the year. Every day there's a new place in the Bible. You have to be really creative to, to, to come up with that. Um, you know, you'd have to use passages where God says things like, I am with you or something like that. Um, but if you're, if you're being kind of technical, really looking at that specific idea of do not fear, fear not, um, it's over 100, which is still a lot of times God doesn't want us to fear, amen? So I'm not trying to dilute the reality of the truth, um, but uh, it, it may not be that exact uh, 365 that some of us have been told. Any of you remember the Fear Not movement in the 1990s? Kind of grew out of the Promise Keepers or Fear Not T-shirts, Fear Not bumper stickers. Any of you remember that? None of you remember that? A few of you? I think I, may, I still have a Fear Not shirt somewhere. Uh, they're still in business, by the way. I just looked it up. There was a whole movement, the Fear Not movement. Anyways, isn't that fun? Number three, <laughs> what does it mean? So we're not supposed to fear, you know, the things of this world, fear those, but the Bible does talk a lot about fearing God, including one of our favorite verses at Seventh-day Adventist, the very first words of the first angel that has the everlasting gospel in his hands, the very first words that he says are, fear God. The last message to go out to the earth in the last days, part of who we are and our identity is to tell the world, fear God and give Him glory. So, what does that mean? And I, there's, I'm not going to give you lists here. I just want to hear some young people share from their hearts, what do you think it means to fear God? Your brother, uh, Jaden, he fears God tremendously because he wants to tell us all about it. Come on, young people. Think about it. I know where you're at. Respect. Respect. He even put his hands together. Respect. Respect. Even a little bow, maybe. Respect. <laughs> sure. Uh, others, though. What does it mean to fear God? Come on. Church, this is our message. We ought to know what it means. <laughs> fear God. Anyone? Come on. Abel? All right. We'll allow, we'll allow some older kids to help out. Come on. Up here. Liliette? She, she was so excited, I can't, I can't leave it out. Let's hear it. What did you say? Revere. Revere. Respect. Revere. Now, you didn't put your hands together. There we go. Revere. Uh, that's a word we use a lot um, to, to differentiate between kind of awful fear and godly fear is revere. Are, is that it? Is that all you got for me this summer Sabbath on July 20th? That's all we got as a congregation? Dylan, you... Uh, Sebastian, Eric, Sean, Luca, you guys like, you've got a lot of knowledge back there, but you're going to keep it to yourself. You're selfish. One more. I just want to hear one more person. Josiah, are you saying you want to help out? What a great guy. Josiah, thank you. To believe in. To be, did you say to believe in God? To believe in God. Respect, revere, believe in God. All right, and last one, Abel. You're going you're gonna to bring it all home now. Devotion. Devotion. That's a big word. Big word, devotion. Thank you, uh, Jaden. Thank you, Toby, for our microphone professional engineers. So it can mean a lot of different things. You'll hear some people say it means to, a, a deep-seated trust in God, to love God more than anything. All these other references, respect, revere, worship, adore God. Uh, there are different ways of, of saying it. My favorite that I've found is, is this idea of absolute surrender and loyalty. When you really fear God, it is a sense of, of, of totally giving yourself to God and obeying Him, okay? If you see, a, if you see a, a Chevy truck on the highway and you're standing in the middle of the road and it's heading towards you at, at, at 60 miles an hour, do you fear that? You fear it, right? And you want to get out of its way, you're going to surrender. You're not going to stand in front of that and say, I defy you. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to show you who's boss. You don't do that. You surrender to it. You get out of the way. Yes, sir. There you go. You're bigger. You're tougher, right? 
you give way to it, not because it's mad at you, well, hopefully it's not unless they're trying to do it, okay? Not because it's mad at you, but because it has the power, right? It has the power and you surrender to it, okay? Fearing God means to give way to God. And that's really what Revelation 14, fear God means to surrender to Him. Give Him glory means to be loyal, to obey. He is God and we are not. So, we are not supposed to fear the things of this earth, but we are to be loyal and totally surrendered to God. I want to use my words carefully here, and I've thought a a lot about this, prayed about it. I don't like to get, as a matter of fact, it's not that I don't like to get political. I believe it's wrong to get political in the church. I don't believe this is the place for it. It's not the place for me to tell you who to vote for, who not to vote for, what political platform is appropriate or not. But I do believe there are times when there are events that transpire in the world that we have to acknowledge. The rise and fall of empires and the leaders who lead those empires is interwoven all throughout prophecy. God spoke specifically about Pharaoh about Nebuchadnezzar. He mentioned Cyrus by name uh, long before he was ever born. He, the, the biblical prophecy pointed to some of the specific Caesars that ruled. Um, there's arguments that could be made that maybe even Martin Luther is specifically referenced in different prophetic uh, passages. There are moments in time that stick out that I think we have to acknowledge. Now, there are a tendency to sometimes to obsess so much about this that we can get in trouble. Growing up in the evangelical church, anytime Israel did anything, anything happening in Israel, an intifada or any of the wars, it was Armageddon is upon us. It is over. We're watching Israel do this. There was this obsession that anything that happened in Israel you know, was prophetically there, and, and it, was, it was last day events. In the Adventist church, sometimes there's an obsession with the Pope, Right? Anytime the Pope does anything, the Pope visits some foreign dignitary, there are some in the Adventist church that, okay, now all the world is wondering after the beasts. This is it. The Lord's about to come because uh, the Pope went to uh, uh, Turkey and, and, and visited dignitaries in Turkey. You know, uh, and, and again, uh, um, I became a, a Seventh-day Adventist in 2001, right around the time that Bush released his every, uh, No Child Left Behind. Remember that? No Child Left Behind. Um, You know, when I was uh, becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, I was literally reading the Left Behind book series. Any of you remember that? It was an evangelical, fictional telling of last day events. I was reading that series when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, when I was exposed to the truths of the church. So this whole idea of left behind among some, uh, even in Adventism, was, oh, the U.S. has passed a law called left behind. Now the U.S. is speaking like a dragon. Jesus is about to come. So I understand that sometimes because of our over-obsession with politics and the things of the world, we've gone too far in our analysis and our interpretation, and it it has numbed some of us so that we don't care what happens in the world uh, politically at all. And so we're kind of on these two ends of of the pendulum. Either people overly obsess with every law that's passed, everything the Pope does, or every world event, and they're, they're looking for things, or they t- completely ignore it and say, I'm just going to live my life, and I don't care who wins the election or what happens. It's, it doesn't apply to me. And I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And I look at, it, again, the prophetic literature encourages believers to look at the rise and fall of empires and the events that are significant at times to the leaders of those empires. While we were here worshiping last week, while we were here having church, a young man was planning to murder the former president and currently, by polls, the leading candidate to potentially be our next president. This is a big deal, I think. Now, again, I am not here to say you need to like this guy, you need to vote for this guy. If it had been Biden or any other significant influential person within the political uh, sphere of America, I would be of the same position right now, okay? I think it's a big deal that the leading candidate for president was almost murdered. And I know that you have 
probably had some of these thoughts. And again, I don't want to get morbid or, or encouraging of, 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 of a thoughtful of darkness, but I think you've probably thought about what would have happened if he'd been successful. Are we in a healthy social environment right now in America where should a disaster like this happen, uh, we would probably be okay? Or do you think if Donald Trump was really murdered, it would cause severe uprising and strife? Again, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet to tell you I know exactly what would happen one way or the other, but it sure seems like it could have led to severe instability beyond what we've experienced for a long time. He didn't die. He survived. And it's going to take a long time of analysis to figure out who this young man was, why it happened, all the failures, all that goes into that. 20 years old, by the way, this kid. 20 years old. It's, it's an amazing moment. Because I do believe that we are in the last days. And it's interesting to note that it always takes some sort of spark to make major transitions that usher in new eras. It didn't happen necessarily. There was about 30 seconds of civility after this event, you know, and and now it's all gone again, as far as I can tell, when it comes to the division in our country right now. Now, just as a student of history, I find it interesting that assassinations have led to some of the largest and most important transitions and trials that this world has ever seen. It was the assassination of Julius Caesar that permanently changed Rome from a republic to an empire. The Rome that Jesus was born into, the Rome of Augustus Caesar, would not have been in existence had it not been for the assassination of his uncle, Julius Caesar. Okay? It was Augustus Caesar who dissolves the Senate and fulfills the promise of Julius Caesar to be dictator for life. Up until then, Rome was a republic. A republic changed into an empire because of an assassination. We could go all into the history of that. A little bit more modern history, we know 110 years ago, it was an assassination that was the spark that opened up the most devastating series of battles and wars this world has ever seen. The assassination of, of the Archduke Ferdinand by the Serbian Gavrili Princep started World War I. World War II was largely a continuation of World War I, and it ushered in the Cold War. And it all started because a 19-year-old, Gavrili Princep was only 19 when he shot Archduke Ferdinand. It was an assassination. Over here across the pond, we've had plenty of these devastating things that have happened in the United States of America. Um, we all know after the Civil War, a 26-year-old man, John Wilkes Booth, shot Abraham Lincoln and slowed and stopped the progression of racial integration in America. It is wide, widely believed and understood that had Lincoln not died, it would not have taken a hundred years to get to the civil rights laws and movements that took place in 1965. It stuttered and slowed this nation because Lincoln's vision was not able to be fulfilled, and all those who followed after him were just not as good and gifted and skilled at reconstructing our country because of an assassination. Now, some of you here are old enough to remember November 22nd, 1963. We all know the story, the assassination of JFK. And this event dramatically changed the course of history. Not only did it forever alter the American public's view of government, if you were to take a survey today, and they still do this, the majority of Americans still believe the government hasn't told them everything about what happened on that day. The majority of Americans find it hard to believe that there was no other factors than just a single gunman. By the way, Lee Harvey Oswald, 24, 24 when he shot JFK. These assassins tend to be young. They tend to be young. Forever altered American destiny 
Not only was the trust in government shattered on that day and on the future of, of the investigation, but the Kennedy Doctrine became more embraced by LBJ. Kennedy, among his many things, were to stop communism, quote, at all costs. Vietnam was largely the, the, uh, the vision, uh, you know, not that Kennedy wanted that, but he wanted to stop communism. And both LBJ and Nixon fulfilled that vision of going into Vietnam and the quagmire and the, the, the scar and the horrendous results partially come back to November 22nd, 1963. Now, not every tragedy has the same results. Many, many people die under violent circumstances. However, it's just a, a reality of our history that sometimes this is what it takes to make major, major changes. And the attempt to take Trump's life, I think, should at least awaken in us a greater desire to be students of the Bible and to be ready for when the real trial does come because I don't think we're far away from it. Does that make sense? So this whole question, now what? So it drew me to prophecy. It did. Friends, if 9-11 and COVID and an attempted assassination on Trump does not stir in your heart at least some desire to reinvestigate the realities of prophecy, I think the Lord is, is trying to get our attention. I think God wants us to, to be more serious about our faith and to remember that this world is not our home. Luke says there, Jesus says in the gospel of Luke, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth, dismay among the nations. Well, of course, that's nothing new. Dismay among the nations has is, is always been thing. But we're going to see an increase and a heightened reality among that dismay. And then he says this, this interesting phrase, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. That's a unique word there, per, uh, perplexity. It means deep anxiety and fear. And I just find it interesting, while this isn't necessarily a presentation totally on prophecy and prophetic interpretation, I do, again, find it interesting that in the last days in which I believe we're living, there is an additional uh, I, you know, obsession or, or focus on our climate, right? Our climate. There's even a worldwide initiative called the Paris Climate Accords. The world is absolutely focused on how our impact on the climate is shaping our world, right? And we have very extreme climate people who are doing things like destroying precious art or stopping highways, and they're willing to go to these great extremes to, 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 to get their... And I'm not saying they're wise. I'm not saying we should all do that. But again, it brings to our attention this, this fascination, this obsession with our ecology, and here in prophecy, it says there's going to be perplexity regarding our world, our oceans, the roaring of the seas. Six of the seven bull plagues in Revelation chapter 16, six of the seven, and you can argue even the seventh one applies as well, all deal with our ecology. The first bowl is poured out on the earth. The second bowl is poured out on the rivers or on the seas. The third bowl is poured out on the rivers. The fourth bowl is poured out on the sun. The fifth bowl is poured out on the throne of the beast, and it causes darkness, which again, you could argue is kind of ecology. The sixth bowl is, play, is poured out on the great river Euphrates. The seventh bowl is poured out on the air. They all deal with ecology. To one, and again, I understand there is symbolism, and there's application, and there's interpretation. But again, I just find it interesting that in the last days, there is an obsession with our ecology and perplexity and fear in the time in which we live. And I think the Lord is speaking to us through these things. And I'm not saying you should take a side one way or the other. You can love uh, all that the climate change argument has, or you can say, I don't really see it that way. But you cannot escape how impactful the message and the idea is. There will be signs, perplexity of what's happening in the world, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And, and Luke, unlike the other, and now this passage can be found in Matthew and Mark and well as well, but Luke phrases it uh, a little uniquely. He actually kind of makes a comparison. Just as people on the earth are in fear and shaking, so are the powers of heaven shaking. 
at what is happening in our world. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, not after they've taken place, not when it's all over, not when it's all said and done, but when they begin, when you notice them, when, they be, when you become aware of them, when they begin to take place, put your head in the sand and forget it. It's over. No. Straighten up. Lift up your heads. Because Jesus is coming. Redemption is drawing nigh. I believe the Lord wants His people to reinvest their heart, mind, and soul into their relationship with Him, into prophecy, into the Word of God. And I believe these moments are happening in our world to draw our attention back to God to draw our attention back to God, because it's so easy for us to get complacent. It's so easy for us to get into the latest series on Disney. It's so easy for us to get into the draft, what's happening, uh, the MLB draft. Any of you who are into that? I'm not. (laughs) It's so easy for our attentions to be drawn elsewhere, and God allows things to happen specifically to draw His His people's attention back to Him. Even in the bold judgments that I mentioned in Revelation 16, after several of those judgments, it, it says, and yet the people refused to repent. In other words, God was allowing these events to get people's attention to realize they need to reorient their lives. This is very important. Prophecy is not given to us to make us comfortable or confident in our present circumstances. Now, there's nothing wrong with being comfortable and confident. And that might be a a byproduct of prophecy. But if all God wanted us to be was comfortable and confident, He wouldn't have to give us prophecy at all. He'd just have to give us His promise. He'd just have to say, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. Trust me. Look at the past. I took care of Moses. took care of David. Took care of the apostles. I'm not going to tell you anything about the future. Just trust me. And that would have been sufficient. As those who believe in God, we could have said, I'm I'm okay with that. I can be comfortable. I can be confident because you're God and I'm not. So prophecy is not given to us to just just sit here and say, that's nice to know. It's nice to know that these things are going to happen. And now I have a better, deeper confidence personally and individually. But that's not why prophecy is given. Prophecy is given to motivate and inspire and to move us and to make us move into different directions and to be more active in the ministry in which He's given us. And we as a people of prophecy, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we who believe God has done something special within our movement and, and raised us up in the last days for a specific reason, if we sit on our heels and if we are simply comfortable and confident and saying, I've read Daniel and I've read Arthur Maxwell and I have Ellen White and boy, am I happy with how things are going to work out for me. We're missing the whole point. God does not want us to reinvest and get back into the prophecies and back in the Bible simply for our own purposes. But so through that experience, God can mold us and shape us and build us and make us more capable of helping others know Jesus Christ. And we are in danger, friends, of losing that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We are in danger of complacency, and I think there are things that happen that God allows that He wants us to be awakened by, and when someone takes a shot at one of the leading influential political candidates who had that bullet been just a little bit off another way, our world may be very different than it is today. Do any of you think our world would be like it is today had that gunman been successful? I I don't think it would be. And I don't mean to be a herald of woe and, 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 and discord. It just seems very likely. Revelation, He said unto me, these words are faithful and true. The God of the spirits of the prophets 
sent the angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Behold is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. The one who does them. The one who embraces them. That makes them a part of their character. That becomes active in understanding and sharing them. That's what it means to heed the words of the book. The blessing is not just for those who take it into themselves and they're very happy about it. The blessing is there for those who let it change them and spur them on to helping others be ready for the world that is to come because this world is passing away. This world is passing away. He said the same thing at the beginning. Blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things. It's all of them. You read it, you hear it, you understand it, and you apply it then the blessing is found. Ninth volume of the Testimonies. It is a wonderful privilege, a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. But this places on us a heavy responsibility. God expects us. He expects us to impart to others the knowledge that He has given us. It is His purpose that divine and human instrument, instrumentalities should unite in the proclamation of the warning message. God gave us a mission, and a mission is not simply for our own comfort and our own happiness, but it's a mission built on the reality of knowing who Jesus is, having confidence, yes, in His pure salvation work for us, but then translating that and helping others also experience the grace of Jesus Christ. And time is growing short. Time's growing short. The opportunities to be partners with God and part of the instrument that He wants to be successful presenters of His grace, time is limited. Time is limited. So now what? I'm going to go through these quickly. I know our time is almost over. First of all, I want to reiterate, this is not a time of fear, and it is not that the, the spirit that God wants us to have. Jesus assures us over and over, we don't need to live in fear. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you have peace. You're going to have tribulation in this world. He doesn't say it's all going to be easy street, but we do not have to be overcome with fear. Take courage, I have overcome the world. So we need not fear the days in which we live. We may need to be sober and serious, but not fear. Secondly, now is not the time to dilly-dally with our faith. Let's get back into the Word. You know, we used to be known as the people of the book. Have you heard that phrase before? The people of the book. People who were so focused on the truth and the passages and the reality and the doctrines and the beauty of what the book of God says to us, that we were defined by that very idea. We need to get back to daily devotions and, purple, and personal Bible study. And of all of the things that we can do, I think this is the most important. A regular, daily exposure and investment into the things that God speaks to us through the Scriptures. Daily walking in the Word. If this is not something that you are doing right now, what are you waiting for? What's it going to take? Of course, Sabbath school and church, that's what we're here for, to support one another, to build ourselves up in the faith and the Word, to learn prophecy. We've been talking among some of the leaders here about small groups. We'd like to see an, ex uh, uh, an experiment, I guess I could say, or uh, an investment into other opportunities for us to grow together in small group ministries. So we're going to look into that. But we also have midweek opportunities like stories and songs from time to time or other things that we do, prayer meetings. This is, this is the time, guys, to get serious. We don't want to wait until the real crisis comes up and then say, oh, I'll get, I guess I'll get serious now. These things are here to remind us. I like what Jesus says there in Luke. He says, straighten up. 
Now, of course, he's talking about having confidence and having composure and not being, you know, uh, shrunken down in fear. But have you ever told your kids, hey, straighten up? <laughs> That's kind of the way I, I'd like to present it to you. And, and Peter says, what sort of people ought you be in light of the reality of the coming of God? In holy conduct and godliness. Straighten up. If there's a vice you've been struggling with, if there is a decision that you know that God wants you to do and you're holding out on doing it, do it now. Don't wait. Straighten up, looking for and hastening the coming of God. Straighten up. You know, before the Day of Atonement, the Israelites and the King James, it says they were to afflict themselves, right? And there were other Sabbaths and special holidays where that terminology, it means to humble yourselves. It means to set all other things aside and say, right now, my focus is solely on the good things of God. And I think that time is now to straighten up. Let's show the Lord that we are serious about our faith. And then he says, lift up our heads. And again, I know that in the context, it means not to droop and and keep your eyes. It means to be courageous and face forward. But I think it can mean more things. Look around you. John sa- and Jesus says in John 4, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. Lift up your eyes and look. I used to, uh, I always loved going to the county fair when I was growing up. I guess there is one here in Maricopa. I've never been to it. Any of you been to the Maricopa fair? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It just seems hot. <laughs> But up in Washington, the fairs are great. And, and, and we used to set up a booth, an Adventist booth. All the churches in Spokane would go together, and we'd sponsor a booth in the, in the pavilion or whatever, and, and we would just have a, a place where we would share literature and things about our faith. And I'll never remember, um, we were managing that booth um, one year, and people would come to the booth, what are you all about? Oh, well, we're the Seventh-day Adventist church, and we'd like you to know more about us. And a young man said, well, what does it mean? What, what, what is a Seventh-day Adventist? And, and I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said, well, we want to, you know, help people understand that there's a better future for them, that there's a, a world out there that God has made for them, that, that we can, you know, not have to be worried about all the problems in this world. I'll never forget. He had to have been 22, 23. He looked at me and said, what problems in this world? What problems? I never remember just being blown away like, Dude, look around. But I want you to know, there's a lot of people who live their life like that. And I'm not saying we should obsess about these things. Oh, woe is us. It's bad over here, and there's drought over here, and there's problems, and crime is bad. You know, that's not what I'm saying. But sometimes we can get in that same thing where we just fail to look around. And I think the Lord wants us to lift up our heads and look. This world is passing away, and God loves every single person in this world. Look at them. Don't ignore them. Look. Look them in the eye. This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of souls. Lift up your heads. God has a plan for every single person, and He has a plan for you to help other people know Jesus Christ as their Savior, but you're not going to see it unless you look up. Look up. Lift up your eyes and look. Look at the fields. They are white. They are ready for harvest. Things can change very fast, people. The world changes a lot faster today than it did years ago. So now what? Now is the time for courage. Now is the time to get back into our Bibles, become the people of the book and study again. Now is the time to get our life in order, recommit ourselves to the Father, to the principles of Jesus Christ. And now is the time to heed the words of the prophecy and to witness And if that lesson alone can be gained from a failed attempt on the life of Donald Trump, I think God is satisfied with that. 
I think God wants us to wake up. Are you ready, friends? Are you ready to recommit your life to Jesus Christ? Heavenly Father, we know that tragedies do come, and we can come, become complacent because time moves on, and the longer time goes, we fall back into our patterns, and the, the, the calamities and crisis don't always usher in the problems or dramatic change that we anticipate in the last days. But every day that goes on, Lord, we know we draw closer to the final conflict and to the, soon, and to the sooner of Your coming. And I don't know, Father, if, if it was Your specific plan this week to draw our attention back to prophecy and our relationship with You because of the incident that happened with the former president. But Lord, I know in my heart it shook me and it made me reconsider the seriousness of my walk and of my commitment and my desire to be prepared and part of your work in these last days. So Father, I pray that that could be something we would all share. We don't wish harm or disaster on anyone. We're very sad that there were those who died because of this and others who were hurt terribly. But God, we thank you that this world is not our eternal home. We thank you that there is something better you have in store for us where there will be no more sadness, no more weeping, no more crying, no more death. Help us to be part of the message and the plan that you have in these days in which we live. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. May the Lord abundantly guide you in your lives. And we hope to see you again next Sabbath.